23rd George Gerbner Lecture in Communication. I also like to uh, uh, acknowledge the presence of uh, uh, George's sons, John. Uh, is Thomas here as well? Or did, did... No, no, okay. So John, uh, his wife Anne, and uh, daughter Katie, welcome. We're really uh, glad, very glad to have you here. Uh, as you know, George Gerbner was the dean of the Annenberg School from 1963 to 1989. One of my favorite quotes from George is, communication is where the action is, the political action, the social action, and the cultural action. As, a, as Annenberg dean, he made the school the national leader in communication research. He established the field of communication as a serious scholarly addition to the academy. He was instrumental in the development of the leading publication in the field, the Journal of Communication. He developed the first world encyclopedia of communication. And he established a Washington program bringing communication researchers and practitioners together, a combination that really, I think, is uh, real emblematic of both the Annenberg School and the University of Pennsylvania. And of course, he was, in his own research, the uh, lead person in the Cultural Indicators Project, the developer of that project, and cultivation analysis, which still remains a central aspect of the, of the field of communication right now. In 1988, the George Gerbner Lecture in Communication began, a year before uh, George stepped down. It was started by President Sheldon Hackney of Penn in honor of George, but it's also a way of honoring our alumni. Uh, the graduates of our program who have gone on to do great work in their own right and who reflect well on the school as well as on themselves. Some of the past lecturers over the last few years included Donna Schwartz, all alumni, John Schwartz of the University of Minnesota, Eleanor Novak of Monmouth University, Christopher Kupke of the Centers for Medicare and Medical, Ser and Medical Services, Robin Nabby of the University of California, Santa Barbara, Diane Zimmerman of Miller, Millersville University, and Karen Wilkins of the University of Texas at Austin just last year. We've also sometimes violated our norm of having our own alum give the Gerbner Lecture. In two cases, one was when Larry Gross, who was a faculty member, a longtime faculty member and colleague of George's, gave the, um, and now at the Annenberg School at the University of Southern California, gave the, the Gerbner Lecture in 2004. And as I like to say at these meetings, and so I apologize for those of you who have been here before, George himself gave the Gerbner Lecture when one of the lecturers who was a, uh, um, planned to give the talk was unable to be here because of weather problems and couldn't make his flight into town. So George, who was just in the audience preparing to introduce the speaker, simply gave, came up and gave a lecture <laughs> that, from all accounts, was quite brilliant uh, at the time. Today we, uh, we have the honor of having Erica Falk, one of our uh, alumni, give today's lecture. I'm not going to introduce Erica. I'm going to introduce uh, Kathleen, who will do the introductions. But Erica certainly brings honor to the school, and so I'm really glad to have her here. So let me briefly introduce Kathleen. I won't say much about her because you all know her so well. She's the former dean of the school, undoubtedly will have a lecture or something like that named after her when she's not no longer uh, here at the school. She's currently the director of the Annenberg Public Policy Center, uh, is the Elizabeth Ware Packard Chair of prof and Professor of Communication here at the school, and is the nation's, I would argue, the leading expert on presidential rhetoric and political discourse in the country right now. So without further ado, please join me in uh, welcoming Kathleen, who will then introduce today's speaker. Kathleen. It's my pleasure to introduce Erica Falk for any number of reasons, but first let me explain why she's here today and why we're here tonight. Over the next couple of days at the Annenberg Public Policy Center, we'll be bringing the nation's most distinguished political communication scholars together to try to forge a consensus about the state of the field or discipline, depending on your perspective, of political communication. And so we've invited back those of our own who contributed importantly to that research tradition. Eric is among them. Hence, this was scheduled tonight because it made it possible for her to attend the conference tomorrow and the next day, but also to be with us today, and that explains the timing of this evening's lecture. Erica came to us at the Annenberg School from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and from San Diego State University via public radio, and that tells you something important about her. 
She didn't actually get her PhD in 1991, or at least she believes she didn't get her PhD in 1991. Now, that statement could be taken to mean that she didn't get her degree or that the year is wrong. I would suggest that she got her degree because I believe being there, that I was there, and a number of you were as well, because a number of you were on the committee. Uh, but we're not going to indicate what year she actually thinks she did get the degree. She's a PhD from the Adver School. But be between the time that she was trying to change the world through public radio and the time that she helped develop and now heads the master's degree program for Johns Hopkins in communication in Washington, D.C., Erica did remarkable work for the Annenberg Public Policy Center. So I'm pleased to introduce her for two reasons. First, I was able to work with her when she was a student, but more importantly, she was my colleague and collaborator through over $3 million of grant-funded research that the Annenberg Public Policy Center did. When she left us here in Philadelphia to go down to D.C., she was the research director for the Annenberg Public Policy Center. Tomorrow, it'll be my pleasure to show her our new home next door. She helped us furnish the place down in D.C. In that capacity, she did three things of note. Many things, but three things of special note. First, she led the team that developed the civility indicators for the House of Representatives bipartisan congressional retreat. She led a graduate team of 10 people, and they searched through the congressional record from 19, early 1940s through the turnover session of the 104th, 1993-1994, for instances of incivility, including tracking the taking down process in Congress. This had never been done by anyone before that. And not only did she do that, with a graduate student team working with her, but actually under her direction, with minimal help from me, what she managed to do was put this thing together in just over three months. This was used by the House of Representatives at its first bipartisan congressional retreat. It was treated with the respect that it deserved by multiple fields that had been studying Congress for all of those centuries and had never thought to study civility in Congress. Why is that important? Look at the debate that we're having right now about the decline in civility in public life. That's a question she took on centrally in that report. And she didn't simply track the taking down process. She developed other indices of incivility from scratch and attached labels such as aspersion to them and then defended those categories against critics having done scans not of 100 words or 1,000 words, but of hundreds of thousands of words of available congressional record. That is a staggering accomplishment. For that, she published a wonderful article. And the lesson of that is this. Sometimes it's not how much you publish, but it's how well you publish. That often cited article provides the baseline for scholarly discussion of civility in Congress. She then, just because she still had time on her hands, coordinated the process of doing the two update reports for the two subsequent bipartisan congressional retreats. Second accomplishment. We were all concerned about money and politics. And we picked up some grants, as we picked up some grants to do civilian Congress, in order to try to track what that money was actually doing. And so we were studying legislative advocacy. And now Erica wasn't up here supervising graduate teams. She was down in DC supervising individuals she hired in DC. She did a series of reports on legislative issue advocacy funded by four different foundations across a more than four year period in which she and her team documented that this as a phenomenon was growing. It was increasingly being attached to what I think we called pseudonymity, which thereby encouraged the press to say, huh? And as a result, was increasing the likelihood that you had no idea who was making the claims that were disproportionately out speaking the other side of important debates, not only in political campaigns, but in legislative advocacy. In the process, here's the important point, actually there are two. She found, with the help of one of her team members, that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were engaging in an awful lot of that issue advocacy. And we couldn't figure out what they were doing. September 15, 2008, we had completed this research almost a decade before I figured out what they had been doing. 
I meant to contact Erica to say, you know, we finally have the explanation, but I was too depressed with my 401k to actually put fingers to keypad and to type the email. Here's the other important thing. As McCain-Feingold was wending its way through the courts, and one of the courts is responsible for checking the facticity of the evidence chain. Elena Capel will be able to tell me which court that is. One of the justices at that level, or judges at that level, wrote that there's one body of uncontroverted research speaking to this issue. That was the legislative advocacy research done by the Annenberg Public Policy Center of the University of Pennsylvania. We promptly called every funder. We put out a press release. We called Walter and Lee Annenberg. That was Erica's team, and that's accomplishment number two. Accomplishment number three. We started putting the National Annenberg Election Survey together. We were trying to figure out how we would integrate a Washington team with a Philadelphia team. Erica was getting really restless. She wanted to be integrated down in Washington, and so she helped us create the National Annenberg Election Study. She didn't stay long enough to find out that ultimately it would produce the results that she and I were looking for, because we knew they were there. We knew that money tied to messages has to move something, and the structural variables can't be accounting for everything. Well, this is another one of those, you know, September 15th, I figured out what we were doing with legis legislative ad advocacy, and with Freddie Mae, Fannie Mac, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, figured out in 2008, the question structure that we'd set up in 2000 finally redeemed itself, and we were able to make that scholarly tie. After Erica moved on, to do for Johns Hopkins and Johns Hopkins students what she had done so well for us, teaching those students what I hope she learned in part here, but also what she developed on her own. We were still bearing fruit out of her earlier work. Those are the three most important things that I remember about Erica Falk. She translates her commitment into public good into research that advances it. Her doctoral dissertation was nonetheless an important study, and she's come here today to talk with you about it doctoral dissertation published by University of Illinois Press, and that would suggest to you that she did something fairly unusual since most dissertations are not published as books, is being reprised today in an important lecture by this, top, this title. I believe the title and the numbers in the title are more accurate than 1991. It's my pleasure to introduce Erica Falk. Thanks, Kathleen. That was sweet. In January of 2007, Senator Hillary Clinton declared her intention to seek the White House, and in doing so, entered the race as a frontrunner for the Democratic Party nomination. A December 2006 national poll by the Gallup organization reported that respondents named Senator Clinton most often as their choice for the Democratic nomination. Senator Barack Obama, who entered the race four days before Clinton, was named second. Despite the fact that Clinton was leading in the polls, 33% to 20%, in the month in which both candidates announced they would run for president, the top six circulating newspapers in the United States ran 59 stories that mentioned Obama in the headline and just 36 that mentioned Clinton. That the press seemed biased against a woman running for president was not surprising. In fact, historical trends show that women candidates for president consistently receive less press coverage than equivalent men running in the same races. What was surprising was that such a disparity was present when the woman was the front runner and that such a pattern, which had been manifest in press coverage since 1884, was still true in 2007. Today I'm going to talk about my book, Women for President, Media Bias in Nine Campaigns, that contains the results of a study I did on how women candidates for president between 1872 and 2008 were covered in the press, especially as compared to equivalent men who ran in the same races. And this isn't exactly my dissertation. When I went to have it published, they told me, cut out this half, add this different half. But it did start as my dissertation. Now, when I embarked on this study, I expected to find two dramatically disparate lines indicating different coverage in the women who ran in the early period and two nicely converging lines resulting in equality in 2008. The surprising conclusion of the book is that there were no trend lines. 
Most of the differences found in the coverage in 1872 were still present in 2008. And this is all the more striking when you consider that in 1872, when the first woman ran, women did not have the federal franchise. No women were elected representatives. Women, with very few exceptions, were not reporters, editors, or newspaper owners. Yet for most of the variables I examined, the trend lines remained flat. The fact that there have been relatively few changes in the press coverage suggests that attitudes about men and women have not changed as much as we think they have. Let me talk for a few minutes about how I conducted the study, and then I'll share you some of the results. The first thing to keep in mind is that in the, uh, the, the first edition of this book, I looked at eight women who ran for president. And I aggregated those data, and those are the data I'm going to talk to you about. And then in the second edition of the book, I updated it with Hillary Clinton, but her data are not part of those early aggregated data. But I still make some comparisons. In looking at those nine women who ran for president, it's important to keep in mind that these are not the only women who have run for president. I was actually trying to find women who got substantial amounts of press coverage so I could make better inferences. And so not included in the study are Patsy Mink, who ran in 1872, Ellen McCormick in 76, Sonia Johnson in 84. Once I came up with a list of women who I was going to examine, I tried to find the most equivalent male candidate running in the same race. And to do this, I relied on polling totals or primary totals, whichever was most relevant for that candidate. And I also took into account uh, experience to make sure the candidates had a kind of equivalent experience. Then I took the highest circulating newspaper in the candidate's home state, both candidates' home state, and the New York Times. And I coded the data from the first day the first candidate entered the race until the last day the candidate exited or the election was held. And after I did that, I, uh, that ended up being about 1,400 articles. I aggregated the results for the eight races. And then, as I said, I added the data for the ninth race. OK, so who are these nine women who have run for president? The first woman widely known to have run for president was Victoria Woodhall in 1872. She ran with the nomination of the Equal Rights Party. She owned her own newspaper and was the first woman stockbroker on Wall Street. Now, she got very few votes. And as a result, finding the most equivalent male candidate, I had to find someone very obscure. In fact, James Black was so obscure, I couldn't even find a picture of him. But he did run with the nomination of the Prohibition Party. The next woman widely known to have run was Belva Lockwood. She ran in 1884. She also had the nomination of the Equal Rights Party, but that was actually a different party by the same name. She was an attorney and partner in her own law firm, and she was the first woman to practice law before the Supreme Court. She was most equivalent in vote totals to Benjamin Butler, who ran with the nomination of the Greenback Party. In 1964, U.S. Senator Margaret Chase Smith ran for that office. She was the first woman holding federal office to run. She had served nine years in the House and 15 years in the Senate and placed third in the popular vote for the Republican primary. The most equivalent vote getter in that vote was Governor Nelson Rockefeller, and they were both running for the Republican nomination. In 1972, U.S. Representative Shirley Chisholm ran. She had served two terms in the New York State Legislature, uh, two terms in the U.S. House of Representatives, and she was most equivalent in primary total to Senator Henry Jackson. They were both vying for the Democratic Party nomination. Lenora Filani ran in 1988. She had the nomination of the New Alliance Party. Uh, she actually didn't quite get enough press coverage to make her all that useful for this analysis. But she was important because she was the first woman on the ballot in all 50 states in the District of Columbia. And she was the second woman, uh, the second, she was the second third party candidate to receive federal primary matching funds. It's, it's also interesting to note that I do believe that the first third party candidate to receive federal primary matching funds was also a woman, and that was Sonia Johnson. She was most equivalent in vote total to uh, then libertarian Ron Paul. In 1988, U.S. Representative Pat Schroeder ran for office. Office. She was a Harvard-educated attorney, served in Congress for eight terms, and she was a senior member of the House Armed Services Committee. 
She was most similar in polling to U.S. Representative Richard Gephardt. They were both vying for the Democratic Party nomination. In 2000, Elizabeth Dole ran. These are now starting to be people you might actually remember. She was a Harvard-educated lawyer. She served as Secretary of Transportation in the Reagan administration and Secretary of Labor in the Bush administration, H.W. Bush. And she was president of the American Red Cross. She also qualified for federal primary matching funds and was most similar in polling to Steve Forbes. In 2004, U.S. Senator Carol Molsey Braun ran for uh, president. She had served six years as an assistant U.S. attorney, 10 years in the Illinois House of Representatives, one term as senator, ambassador to New Zealand, and she was most similar in her polling to Senator uh, Bob Graham. They were both running for the Democratic Party nomination. Those are the eight women that I originally looked at and aggregated their results. Of course, in 2008, U.S. Senator Hillary Clinton ran. She was an attorney educated at Yale, second term in the U.S. Senate. Now, Clinton had served as the First Lady of Arkansas and also of the United States, but as you probably know, her term as First Lady was very unusual because she actually had an office in the West Wing, and you probably also remember she headed the task force on national health care reform. But you may not know that she actually worked on several other pieces of less, no, less well-known pieces of legislation, and her most equivalent candidate was Barack Obama. Okay, so what did we find when we compare these candidates? Well, the first and most striking result is that men candidates get twice as much coverage as women candidates do. And when looking at this chart, it's important to keep in mind that I wasn't comparing winning male candidates to losing female candidates. These candidates all lost well. They were all losing candidates. Uh, and yet there were twice as many articles written about the men candidates, and those articles were actually 7% longer. If you look at the trend over time, you'll see we're not, you know, it's not like, woo, there's not a really good trend there. Um, Clinton is actually not on this race because as a front runner, the order of magnitude was really much higher in terms of the number of articles uh, per month. But if we look at Clinton, um, Clinton actually did better than women who preceded her, but not better than Obama. Uh, whereas the eight aggregated races, the women had, uh, you know, 50% the coverage of men, or sorry, let me say, men had 100% more coverage. In this case, Obama had only 20% more coverage. So Clinton definitely did better than the women who preceded her. I also wanted to look not only at the amount of coverage, but the substance of the coverage. And to do that, I looked at issue coverage. I coded each paragraph to see if it was primarily about issues. And you can see the men get significantly more issue coverage when, when comparing them to equivalent women who ran in the same races. 16% uh, of the paragraphs about the women were about issues. 27% of the paragraphs about men were. That meant the men got 68% more issue coverage than the women. Now here again, and, and I'll talk about this a few times over the course of this discussion, uh, Clinton did better. In fact, Clinton and Obama had about the same percent of issue coverage. But of course, what's interesting about this is they're not covered like typical white men. They're, they're covered more like women. And this is when we have to start talking about some of the unique features of the 2008 race. The first unique feature is that Clinton runs against a black man instead of a white man. And the second unique feature is that Clinton enters as a front runner. Most candidates don't enter as front runners. And so whether this is, you know, um, here's, this is actually interesting. Take a look at this. If you really want to be optimistic, you might see a trend here starting in like 1987. We have this huge gap. And then you can see, you know, it's getting, it's getting a little bit closer here. Maybe you have convergence in 2008. Uh, I'm a little bit less pessimistic on that account, precisely because this 2008 was so unique with a black man running against a white woman who was a front runner. And I think if both of those were not true, we might not see that. But we'll have to wait for the next election to see if this really is a trend about uh, convergence or if it's just a, you know, just a kind of a bump. All right, uh, I was also looking for subtle ways in which the press might have conveyed disrespect for the women. And one of the ways I did that was to look to see how often the press dropped titles. What's a drop title? A drop title is when the press refers to the candidate, for example, instead of saying Senator Chase Smith, if the press said Mrs. Chase Smith, if they dropped her honorary title in, uh, for her marital title. 
This happened much more often to women than it did to men. In fact, women's honorary title, when they had them, were dropped in 32% of the cases. Men were only dropped in 11%. And you can see the Clinton pattern pretty much approximates this. Clinton does a little bit better than the women who precede her, 25% of her references. But her title is still dropped more frequently than it was uh, for Obama. I also was, wanted to look at some stereotypes. And one of the stereotypes I looked at is how often the women were described or the candidates were described physically. And I coded it as a physical description. Uh, for example, if the reporter noted that the candidate was beautiful or her hair was parted or his hair was parted, parted or wore a black suit. It turns out that when you look at it this way, m women received four physical descriptions for every one used to describe a man. And looking at the data, and I cut the data another way, 40% of the articles contained at least one physical description for women, while only 14% of the articles contained at least one physical description for the man. And again, here's another one where you get this beautiful chart. I mean, you know, those lines, they go up, they go down, but this is certainly not a story about increasing equality over time for men and women. Um, let's see. Uh, where am I? Um, it turns out that, again, Clinton and Obama do better than previous races. Obama uh, had a physical description in 12% of the articles that mentioned him. Clinton just about the same at 15%. But what's really interesting when you look at these data are how they describe the candidate. So, for example, when Obama was described physically, in almost all cases, they were describing his race, never his gender and never his attire. When Clinton was described physically, it was always her sex or what she was wearing. So, again, is this a trend? I tend to doubt it, but we'll see in the next election. Now, one of the things that's interesting, like a lot of these data I looked at were like uh, the elite media, you know, um, the very edited, you know, high circulating newspapers. But there was a very interesting trend in the Clinton data. And what happened was um, a piece ran in the Washington Post by Robin Given. And this is what she wrote, quote, there was cleavage on display Wednesday afternoon on C-SPAN 2. It belonged to Senator Hillary Clinton. Despite the fact that Clinton was talking about education policy, the author noted she was wearing a rose-colored blazer over a black top. The neckline sat low on her chest and had a subtle V-shape. The cleavage registered after only a quick glance. Following this, MSNBC devoted a total of 23 minutes and 42 seconds to segments discussing Senator Hillary Clinton's cleavage. During the same period, CNN devoted three minutes and 54 seconds to coverage of her cleavage. But what was even more interesting is that once you had kind of this breaking of a discussion and description of a candidate sexually in the mainstream media, what occurred in the non-elite media was even more shocking. Posts on YouTube were among the most outrageous. A few videos contained digitally altered pictures of Clinton during the address described by Given, but with huge bulging breasts. One included altered shots that showed Clinton in pornographic pictures with huge uncovered breasts, while two men performers sang, She's My Cherry Pie. Another digitally altered photo of a debate between, it was a, of a debate between Clinton and Obama. It showed Clinton with huge breasts and Obama with a thought bubble. Nice tits. One interesting aspect of this was that once the article in the mainstream media cracked the taboo about talking about the candidate's sexuality, it unleashed vast amounts of even more degrading discourse in the non-elite media. Clinton's appearance was also the discussion of much chatter on the web. A Google search for Hillary Clinton is ugly yielded over 4,000 hits. A similar search for Barack Obama is ugly yielded 10. And the implicit disrespect that I was looking at in my study found in the print coverage of this race and previous races pales in comparison to some of the explicit disrespectful ways in which Clinton was described on the internet and in the broadcast media, I should mention. Unlike previous races, Clinton was frequently described as a bitch. 
If you do an internet search for Hillary Clinton is a bitch, there were over 9,000 hits. Barack Obama is a bitch, five. Barack Obama, perhaps more equivalently, is a bastard, nine. On YouTube, there were 427 videos linking Hillary Clinton to the word bitch, including Hillary Clinton, crazy bitch, Hillary Clinton is a bitch, and Hillary bitch. The fact that bitch was the epithet of choice for Clinton reveals the way in which sexism in modern culture works to preclude women from leadership. Communication scholar Karen Anderson noted bitch is a gendered term that is used almost exclusively for powerful or assertive women. There are no similar terms in English that castigate men for acting leader-like. All right, and back to the dry stuff. Uh, I wanted to look at how, you know, if the women were described as just as viable as men. I mean, given that the polling and the voting data suggest that these women were just as viable as the men. And so uh, I counted as a viability mention, a positive viability mention, if the press said something like this. Senator Smith's chances in the three-way battle in New Hampshire would be pretty good. Or Rockefeller will be a front runner. Men had three times the positive viability comments as women. And here you can see the Clinton and Obama data were actually perfectly consistent with the previous trends. I also wanted to look at emotion. For example, if the candidate described, if the reporter described the candidate as alarmed or moved to wipe away tears or even delighted, women received two times the emotional descriptions per 10,000 words as men. And you can see, again, there's pretty much no trend over time here. Uh, and the Clinton data was consistent. Clinton was five times more likely to be described emotionally as was Obama. But these dry data in some way pale in comparison to what happened at Portsmouth. Uh, the double standard on emotion was aptly demonstrated on January 7th, 2008, one day before the New Hampshire primary in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. An undecided voter asked presidential candidate Senator Hillary Clinton, how do you do it? How do you keep so upbeat and wonderful? In answering the question, Clinton's voice quivered and tears appeared in her eyes. The incident at Portsmouth subsequently generated vast amounts of press coverage. In the week that followed, there were over 500 stories, uh, 500 stories in the major U.S. English language newspapers found in LexisNexis, and over 85 of them actually headlined with Clinton's tears. What you probably don't remember as well is less than a month earlier, Mitt Romney, Republican candidate, had teared up while talking about the history of blacks in the Mormon church on Meet the Press. The incidents were similar. Neither candidate cried, but both teared up while having a choke in their voice. Despite the similarity, the same data set that carried over 500 stories about Clinton carried only 14 about Romney. And one of the last things I wanted to look at was the, what was, what did the papers say explicitly? I mean, a lot of this stuff I looked at were kind of implicit content. But what did they say explicitly about why a woman should not be president? And there were some enduring arguments that were made in the press. The first argument against women as president is that women are simply incompetent as leaders. And often there were no reasons given for this, but when they were given, there's usually two explanations. First, that women are too emotional to lead, thinking back to the fact that the press was more likely to describe women as emotional, this is interesting, or the fact that women simply cannot handle crises. And let me give you an example of just how this might appear in the press. Quote, how can anyone nominate a woman for president or a woman wanting to be president is beyond me. Can't you just imagine a woman being faced with a crisis? Cuba, such as President Kennedy had, the office for president or vice president is no place for a woman. Quote, would you be prejudiced against a woman running for president of the United States? Yes, entirely prejudiced. Women are not qualified for that high office. If one is ever elected president, she would have to depend 100% on the advice of men she appointed to high executive positions. 
The second enduring argument against women at, for the presidency was that women are simply unnatural as leaders, right? Women belong in the home. They're supposed to be doing child rearing. It's a private space. The public space is for men. Women are simply unnatural in this public space. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read you three examples, each one from a different century. And you tell me if you can even figure out which century these come from. OK, number one, at present, Man, in his affection for and kindness towards the weaker sex, is predisposed to accord her any reasonable number of privileges. Beyond that, he pauses, because there seems to him to be something which is unnatural in permitting her to share in the turmoil, the excitement, and the risks of competition for the glory of governing. OK, that's number one. Number two. Maybe the great majority of women just aren't interested in public careers. They don't have what intellectuals nowadays like to call motivation. Though women make up a substantial part of the nation's workforce, only a relatively few hold top jobs. Could this be because women are essentially mothers and homemakers at heart? And number three, I don't believe a woman ought to be in that particular place of leadership. She would be a good helpmate but the Bible teaches us that a woman should not have authority over men. OK, unnatural to permit her in the turmoil, the excitement, and the competition for the glory of governing. Women are essentially mothers and homemakers, or women should not have authority over men. OK, well, I've given you a hint. They're actually in chronological order. From 1872, it is unnatural to permit her in the glory of governing. From 1964, women are essentially mothers and homemakers at heart. And from 2000, women should not have authority over men. Now, these are all explicit ways in which uh, you know, women were described as unnatural in the political sphere. But there are also subtle ways. And one of the things I point out that I think helps kind of subtly convey this idea that women don't belong in the public sphere is what I call the novelty frame. And so what's interesting, you have this women running for like over 130 years, right? And I looked at, I looked at nine of them, and that wasn't even all of the women who have run. And somehow, everyone was the first. So for example, in 1964, notwithstanding the at least two women who had preceded her, one reporter wrote, even in defeat, Chase Smith could take solace in the great accomplishment alone and always be proud and happy that she had the distinction of being the first woman in the country to bid for that office. Then in 1972, the Seattle Times penned, Representative Shirley Chisholm today became the first black woman to begin a serious bid for the presidency of the United States. Then in 1988, one newspaper printed, if Schroeder gets into the race, she will be the first woman to seek a major party presidential nomination since 1972. And then the New York Times described Dole in 2000 as the first woman to become a really serious president presidential candidate of the United States. And yes, in 2007, the New York Times wrote, if successful, Mrs. Clinton, 59, would be the first female nominee of a major political party. All right, the last thread of arguments as to why women shouldn't be president is that they are simply unviable as candidates. And one of the most interesting things about this trend is, is how it's articulated in the press through about 1988. When it's articulated, it's almost always using this very ambiguous phrase, the country is not ready for a woman president. So for example, in 1964, quote, the country is not ready for a female president. In 1988, many observers have said that Schroeder, because she is a woman, does not have a serious chance at the presidency. And then in 2000, my gut feeling about Dole is that she has a good chance at the vice presidency but my gut is that the country is not ready for a woman president. What's particularly interesting is what the press doesn't do. It doesn't unpack this. It doesn't ask what ready is. It doesn't say ready is actually prejudice and sexism, right? The reason we're not ready is because we're prejudiced and sexist. It never unpacks it. It never says, when will we get ready? How do we know when we're ready? So anyway. The book shows that men and women, that men receive more and longer press coverage compared to equivalent women in the same race. Moreover, the trend does not seem to be abating. For example, 
The differences in the number of stories written about Carol Mosley Braun and Bob Graham in 2004 were larger than the differences between Shirley Chisholm and Henry Jackson in 1972. In addition, the coverage that men received was more substantive about issues and less tangential mentions of physical appearance than was the coverage of women. Now, Clinton did better on both of these measures, but whether this signifies a new era, era or only if white women frontrunners running against black candidates will be treated as seriously as presidential, President Cl or, or candidate Clinton was, we have yet to see. That said, Clinton, like the other women, were portrayed as more emotional and their professional titles were more likely to be dropped. Now, during the mid-1800s, when Victoria Woodhull considered running for office, women could not vote. They had not held state or national office. It was difficult for women to act politically at all. Walking door to door without a husband or escort was considered unwomanly. And women who engaged in this type of political activism were often met with verbal abuse. Accommodations for women traveling alone were rare. Respectable restaurants would not serve women after 6 p.m. unless they were escorted by a man. This is very different from the one in which Hillary Clinton ran for president in 2008. With the radical changes that have taken place for women in politics and journalism over the last 130 years, it's surprising that press portrayals of women candidates have not changed more. Although I found some differences in the press coverage over time, the strongest trends did not show regular progress. Instead, they suggested that women candidates between 1872 and 2008 were treated differently from their men counterparts, with women often getting the short end of the stick. The biased coverage may be very understandable given extant sex roles and sexism in American society. We should be no less concerned about its potential impacts. The important one might not be the one you come, that comes to mind first. Current and historical coverage of women candidates, or lack thereof, may deter women from running. By framing women candidates as not serious, not viable, by giving extra measure to their hair and their appearance and what they wear, the press may dissuade potential women candidates from entering the political arena. People, including women, have a hard, believe that women have a harder time than men getting elected to office. But it turns out this actually isn't true. When women run, they win just as often as men do. But women rarely run. The results of this study suggest that this misapprehension may come at least in part from press accounts of women candidates that portray women as less viable than equally viable men. If women have a negatively skewed impression of their chances of winning, they may be less likely to run. And this may be the one of the most important and worrisome potential impacts of press coverage of women. I'm sure you have questions, things to discuss? Yes. just like this on race alone and come up, I'm sure, with just as compelling findings. 
Uh, the other thing that's interesting is that there, there, there is this interesting, and I do write about this in, in the book. I mean, there's this wave of like just this kind of outrageous disrespect for Clinton and describing her as the bitch, and then there is the kind of the reclamation of bitch, and it doesn't only happen in the Tina Fey kind of skit. If, if any of you are not familiar with that. Tina Fey is on Saturday Night Live, and she says something, you know, she's playing Hillary Clinton, and she says something like, you know what, I am a bitch, but bitches get things done. And so it's just kind of this reclamation of, you know, bitches, you know, successful, and, you know. This actually happens a few times in the print media as well, uh, where kind of notable feminists get on to talk about the idea of the bitch as the successful, assertive woman, and it's just that we disregard her. Yeah. century. <clears throat> How does age relate to this? My gut is that people hesitate to mention the age of women more yep. than they mention. Nope. Uh, age is something I coded for. It turns out women, and I don't have the exact, like, what's the differential in my head, but women's ages are mentioned more frequently than men's. Now, what's interesting about that is, you know, one of the things I looked at is when women are described physically, how are they described? You know, what, what kind of terms? And when men are described physically. So when women are described physically, it's almost always to mention their sex, that she, you know, she is a female candidate, or what they're wearing, you know, like high-heeled boots, whatever. When men are mentioned physically, it's almost always their age, or I think their facial expressions. Um, but women's ages are actually still mentioned more frequently than men's. second edition of the book in the Clinton, I, that was the only place where I looked at new media. And I only made a formal comparison um, in a few cases. So for example, uh, the mainstream press was more likely to write articles about Obama. It turns out that uh, Obama was also more likely to be mentioned in blogs. So uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, no, it does. And there's another thing that I mean, I just want to venture uh, speculation in terms of the, yeah. the uh, appearance, and that is, I mean, Men wear uniforms. These, their suits are uniforms, you know, and they differ marginally with their tie or whatever. But women's dress is much more variable in some sense. So there's sort of there's more to notice uh, in in that kind of thing with women. I'm not yeah. defending it or or condemning it, but it's not the same universe. In that sense. I think that's true. I mean, if, if, when, when reporters hear my research, that's that's what they pretty much always say. That women's dress is more interesting. I have two thoughts on that. The first is that, you know, after having read, you know, 1,400 articles describing women's dress, it's really not that interesting. <laughs> so, so and actually, I read about this in the book. So, I, if you pull, I can pull out a description for uh, Velva Lockwood, and it describes her as wearing a black dress. And you can find a description of Margaret Chase Smith wearing a black dress. Now, by the time it gets to, you know, Dole, she's wearing a black suit. Right, but if you actually start looking at those descriptions, they're neither interesting nor all that diverse. Now, I do understand it might be a little bit more diverse than than the men, but arguably, I, you know, I'm not sure they they wear boots too. I think some of them. Um, the other thing that I think it says about our culture is that you know we don't report about the fact that the candidates have different eye color because in our culture that's not relevant to politics. And you know the fact that the press is writing about 
women's attire is precisely because of our stereotypes, you know, where we think about attire is important for women in a way that we don't for men. And so I just think it reflects, you know, the reporter's just reflecting back our own culture to us. Yeah. candidates, not for president, women candidates for other offices? Yeah, there have been other studies done at lower level races that, you know, and I want to, like, you really have to be careful about, you know, but, but for example, uh, that women get less press coverage has been documented at lower level races. Um, the fact that attire is mentioned happens at lower level races. Now, I mean, I'm being extremely reductionist here in saying this, but like, if you want a little nugget, it kind of gets a little bit better the further down you go, like, so mayoral races, you see less, and presidential races, you see more. But again, even that's pretty reductionist. Yeah. Uh, do you look at health at all as a way in which people talk about stuff? Because I have a hunch that for men, health is the way that people talk about appearance. So I'm thinking far back as President Taft. Yeah. And if you wanted to think about obsession with how people look, look at the coverage of President Taft, who was, right. of course, the fattest president but, in history, <laughs> which at that point came to stand for virility and strength which of course now would be very differently. So in the most recent election, we had a lot of discussion <coughs> on President Obama's health, right. which once he took off his shirt, became a whole other conversation altogether. <laughs> so right. I'm just wondering if there's a way in which what is called attire for women gets called health for men. So it's actually not as big as disparity as it might sound. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly possible. I wasn't looking for that. I'm trying to be really careful. I don't know if you have an example. Like if, if a man was described as fat, that would have been caught in my coding. Um, and there, I, had, I, I think we don't use the word fat so much as health in any, any, media. Anything that, that had to do with their stature. Stature was one of the things we were okay. I was specifically looking for. So, um, <coughs> but, but even stature was more likely to come up for women as in diminutive stature as opposed to men for large stature. But I mean, I'm sure, like, if you went specifically looking for health, you might find some interesting things. Yeah. Well, thank you. Well, this fits into you know, a more international perspective. How you might try and compare elections in different countries to this. Okay, so there's actually was an interesting study, and I didn't do it, where they looked at women who were prime ministers or presidents, and they compared their press coverage to their immediate successor or predecessor. And it turned out, again, women got less press coverage, even as governing leaders, than their immediate predecessor or successor. I cut you off, but... No, no, I very good. In fact, I was actually thinking about what happens when they retire. I and mean, one of the things that stuck in my mind about when Kim Campbell left yeah. office in Canada was how brutally she was attacked by the press and treated as this <laughs> figure who could never get a job again. Oh, really? and, um, but I wonder, thinking about Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan, how they were treated by the press mm -hmm. once they both left office as past heads of state, whether they received similar levels of respect and yeah. priority. Yeah, that would be really interesting. There's a dissertation. <laughs> yeah, there is. observation that uh, there seems to be a general perception, perception that, um, I kind of want to go back to the viability um, of the can these uh, female candidates, there seems to be this general perception that um, if uh, the candidate is um, competent or is perceived as competent, then she's not perceived as likable, like there's almost this trade-off between competency and, and perceived likability, and so I just wanted to know what you thought, if you thought that was really kind of the biggest barrier uh, in terms of, you know, kind of um, yeah. <coughs> marrying the two somehow. You know, I, this was probably most starkly exhibited in the Clinton campaign, where, you know, she was kind of uh, cold, right, and strong, um, but that, that kind of fed into this, like, removed, you know, bitchy, kind of unlikable uh, persona. Um, but then, you know, when she cries, right, and she softens up, and then you have people in the press, and there's incredible quotations in the press after she cries of, like, uh, Dick, Dick Morris saying, well, we, we can't elect somebody like that. Uh, she's emotionally unstable, or she might have a breakdown, you know, if in office. I mean, they completely, and there were other just com completely outrageous kind of articulations that she was... Um, uh, you know, it, it, it revealed her complete unsuitability for office. And I do think, you know, 
to Kathleen's point, this, this is a double bind, right? I mean, you, you're, you're likable and you're soft and then you're incompetent, right? And if you're, if you're competent and strong and then you're unlikable. I, I do think this is an important um, challenge that women candidates have to, have to really carefully navigate. Yeah. One of the things I noticed, particularly uh, in uh, the coverage of Hillary Clinton, uh, and, it's, uh, and this strikes me as a peculiarity of the American political leadership system, is that you're also perceived as the military leader, as the commander-in-chief. And I would have thought, sort of intuitively, that that, so to speak, sort of weighed heavily against perceptions of women. So I wonder if you can, so to speak, disentangle a bit what the notion of leadership means. Is it political and or military or can one well, I, make Right. I two thoughts on that. The first is that they've actually done these studies, right, where they ask people to describe the characteristics they seek in a, in a leader, right? And then there's other studies that, that ask people to describe characteristics typical of men and typical of women. The characteristics described for typical of men all coincide very nicely with the characteristics typically deci uh, described for leaders. Uh, decisive, strong, right, in, in, rational, right? And, but if you look at the list of uh, terms that we use to describe women, they're all distinctly not leader-like. Emotional, soft, nurturing. And so I do think you're onto something that our, our conceptions of leadership kind of in Western culture uh, coincide with, with you know, our conceptions of masculinity. So that's the first thing. The second thing is um, Kate Kensky and I actually did a really interesting study. If you look at polling uh, about, there's this polling question that's been asked since like 1939 that said, you know, uh, if, if a qualified woman were nominated to your party, would you vote for her, right? And notwithstanding the craziness of that question, right, because you've never asked if a qualified man were nominated because, Man. But uh, notwithstanding that, so in like 1939, like 30, well, that's what the right. um, like, 60% of the population says that, um, they, that they would not vote for a woman. But, but this, the, the, this drops over time. In fact, it roughly keeps pace with the year. And so by like 1970, 70% of the population say they would vote for a woman. And by 1990, about 90% of the population said they would vote for a woman in this generic question, problematic question. Um, but one of the things that we found is that in times of war, that this percent actually drops. And this is getting to your point as well, is that this role as head of the military does seem to be a particular challenge for women. And when this is, like, when news about a war uh, predominates the headlines, women are probably at a disadvantage in a presidential contest. Because ratings went up enormously. Oh, is that right? After she proved herself as the great war leader <laughs> uh, against uh, uh, Argentina. <laughs> <laughs> For you, Erica, but it, it, it's two questions with this, really the same intent. And it is uh, what you might say, uh, what in your opinion would be characteristics of, the, of a female candidate for president who would have the greatest likelihood of success? Or alternatively, if you were in the role of advising somebody who was running for president as a female candidate, what kinds of things would you, from what you've learned about the media, be able to tell her? Or is it yeah. just not, is it all just structural and there's nothing no. you can do that? So, and, and there, you know, I should say that there are different opinions out there. And there are definitely people who propose this run as a woman. I think Patty Murray, is that some of the member of Congress who kind of ran, I'm a mom in tennis shoes, you know, kind of running as a woman. But I would actually have to say, what, who was it? I was saying she's a hockey mom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, but, but I would actually, I would probably, if, like, if Hillary Clinton, you know, had called me, you know, I would have said a couple of things. I, I probably would have given her advice similar to what advice I think she was getting, which is that it's more important to be non-emotional, like you don't want to show emotion on the campaign trail, precisely because so many of the explicit arguments uh, against women ride precisely on this idea that women are too emotional and therefore, therefore irrational. So first of all, it's this false dichotomy. And, and second of all, that therefore they're unable to handle leadership. So I would say be non-emotional. I would also encourage her to wear, you know, kind of formal outfits like a pantsuit, like the most, like what businesswomen wear, kind of a high status outfit. 
Um, I would encourage her to emphasize issues, because I think you probably have to play higher to issues to get your issues in the press. So I, mean, I think you can look at each of these findings, and you can say um, there's, there's, a there's a response strategy that could in advance target. And, and you know, my guess is that she did most of that. I mean, I can't, you know. I, I, and I, the last thing I would say is uh, there's a surprising amount of sexism printed in the press about women that came from the women candidates themselves. And I would advise her to avoid that. So for example, Margaret Trey Smith has this famous quotation where she's asked, what would you do if you went up against Brezhnev or you know, somebody? And, and she says, well, I would beat him if it were baking blueberry muffins. And you go, oh, God. <laughs> Eight, yeah, I'm sorry. I'll, <laughs> do you have an idea with respect to women reporters yeah, thank you. I actually went into the project hoping to code for, for the gender of the reporter. Here's where the problem came in. First of all, and you may not know this, uh, in the 1800s, there were no bylines. I don't know, I can't remember what year that exactly ends up changing. So, and then the second thing is um, AP stories don't have bylines either. And so I just had way too much missing data. Now, I know there have been studies, you know, probably more modern that have looked at this, and I don't remember the exact results, but they're not as simple as you'd think. It's not simply like, oh, women reporters cover women more fairly. It's not like that at all. It's actually a pretty complicated pattern. Yeah. You know, the men don't, when, when you say that they have a, a leader image, I think it breaks down into two things. Men are fighters and men are lovers. And if you think about Bill Clinton, for example, that, that you know, and notwithstanding what happened to him, in fact, during yeah. the campaigns, they were full of metaphors about what a sexy guy he was and a lover and all this kind of stuff. And of course, that was true of Obama as well. Yeah. There's all these fertility metaphors. And it seems to me the problem is, or one of the problems is that uh, it's unclear what those roles mean for women, but Sarah Palin is a fighter and a lover. Now, yeah. she lost, but she was also perceived as very viable for, you know, a certain group in the population, and I think Hillary had trouble with the lover, with the yeah. lover thing. I mean, she actually didn't do so bad on the fighter stuff, but it, her un the undermining was with the messing up of those two, two kinds of images. That's not a very clear statement, but I think what I'm saying is that for women to occupy those roles is fairly new. And, you yeah. know, to work out what that means, whether they're just, you know, uh, prostitutes, you know, yeah. or, or whether it's legitimate for women to be lovers, or, you know, the big breast thing suggests to me that maybe there's a mother thing working there, too. Yeah. You know? So it, it seems to me more complex. If yeah. you kind of break it up into the fighting and the fertilizing, you might get yeah. different pictures. Well, you know, I think. Palin is so interesting. I mean, and I I actually kind of like her for this reason. Look at look at the kind of the metaphors of Palin. She's a pit bull. She's a hunter. You watch her show. She's cutting down trees. I mean, this is like off the charts masculinity, right? She's the barracuda, but at the same time, she's off the charts feminine. She's the mother of five. She's the beauty queen, and that's what makes her so interesting because she's got this incredibly high masculinity, high femininity um, image. Uh, it's going to be really interesting to watch if she runs. So if you take the 2008 data, which is obviously treated differently out, it's pretty compelling what you're arguing that there hasn't been a trend that would suggest these things, that, that there's differences. But a lot of the data suggested that certain elections were different than other elections. Is there anything that yeah, you know the, that? I mean, I, I think the race thing is really important, you know, and I don't look at it, but it's it's important. So for three of those women were black women in my data set. So that's that's one thing. Um, the second thing that's um, important, for example, the the Schroeder race, actually, the Schroeder Gephardt race, um, I actually cut the data in a slightly different way for that race, and that ends up you know, kind of, it actually makes it seem closer than it would have been. Um, Gephardt ran for like 13 plus months, and uh, uh, Schroeder ran for like four. And so I actually, I only look at those four months. So because of that, usually when candidates declare in the early period, they get this high spike in coverage. And so that makes it seem like he's getting less coverage. So that's kind of one artifact of the method. Um, and, and I think, you know, we have to keep in mind that, like, this whole idea of getting comparable candidates is fraught. 
right? Because it's like this very limited pool. And, and yeah, I mean, it's true that Carol Nelson Braun has like exactly the same polling results as Bob Graham, but you know, he's actually sitting in the Senate, you know, and she's not, and that, that makes a difference. That said, I mean, I think that's why it's important to look at all this over the aggregate. You know, in any one race, we could argue about what are the contextual individual factors. But when you start to put nine races together, then I think you start to say, hey, maybe there's something we have to look at here. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to just say from earlier, because um, Eileen, Eileen, Eileen Walsh has written about um, Hillary Clinton and her performance of white, of white masculinity. And I, I think I was trying to think about her transition from kind of homemaker and, and as a first lady to with her long hair and this kind of transition to being a politician and even the kind of the cold personality following her from her Lewinsky days, right, where mm -hmm. that woman didn't come near my husband to the, you know, discovery of the blue dress. And, and so I, I think that there's, there's a way in which she's a really weird candidate to analyze, um, particularly because she's making these transitions, even now her hair is growing back out, right? And so there are these kind of perceptual sheets on the cover of Vogue magazine, and she has these really soft images during her tenure as a first lady. And so I, I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm struggling with kind of that transition and what that feeds into her, the way in which people respond to both her femininity and her appearance and all sorts of other aspects of Yeah, I think that's right. This transition, transition from first lady is kind of, you know, unique to Hillary Clinton. At the same time, it's important to remember that, you know, she's like an attorney. I mean, she's a working mom. I mean, I, you know, it's just that she's not really a homemaker before that. It, I mean, I, I'm just, I'm... Yeah, Rodham goes away, comes yeah, back. There's a number of concessions and, and there's a number of performances that she, she participates in in terms of both femininity and masculinity during yeah. her, her um, public... So I, I don't know, I, I feel like those are really yeah. kind of fascinating moments that it's, it's something she's manipulating in terms of press coverage. Yeah, that's right. right. She's, she's, just, she's trying to figure it out. <laughs> Were there other times at which the personality coverage was perhaps more favorable than the issue coverage? Yeah, okay, so it turns out, like, I didn't go through every result in the book. It actually turns out that I actually looked at what I called character coverage, which included everything from personality to, to experience. Women actually get more character coverage. But one of the reasons I didn't talk about it in the talk, that it's one of those patterns that's actually really complicated. It's not like a simple more or less. Uh, what you see is in the early period, um, women really get more character coverage. And my hypothesis about this is because these are mainly articles about women doing something unusual, right? But Belva Lockwood is an attorney. You know, Woodhall is the first woman stockbroker on Wall Street. You know, even Margaret Chase Smith, right, is a senator. Like, so th there's a lot of character coverage. It actually ends up kind of diminishing over time. Um, but yes, I think what basically happens, like if you're going to talk in generalities, is like men get more issue coverage, and women, because they're kind of described as this novelty, right, get, that, that can just get traded off for character, personality, experience coverage. Thank you very much.